Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. If I had my druthers, I would be in Poughkeepsie. You know, I think Zoom is fine, but it can never ever replace a live performance. So I apologize for that, but we'll deal with what we have. And if I do my job right, you won't care whether I'm there in person or whether we're doing it through Zoom, you'll be listening to about L. Frank Baum and you'll be interested in that more than anything else. Uh, when you mentioned about October and spooky, this is the first day of October, but um, I think it's very appropriate to do L. Frank Baum because you know the last day of October is Halloween. And needless to say, when you think of witches throughout the century, you'd be hard pressed to find a witch more famous in the 20th and 21st century than the witch created, the Wicked Witch of the West, by L. Frank Baum. In fact, I want to begin by talking about fairy tales in general. As you probably know, when you read a fairy tale, you're bound to find elves, leprechauns, dwarfs, gnomes, pixies, trolls, witches, hobgoblins, gremlins, imps. You can find all sorts of supernatural creatures in fairy tales, except the one supernatural creature you almost never find in fairy tales is a fairy. Very few fairies. The most famous, of course, is Tinkerbell in Peter Pan, but she is an exception. So it seems odd that for a genre that features all these other weird and wild creatures, fairies are pretty much left out. So why in the world, when they could have named tales anything, did they name them fairy tales? Well, they didn't name them fairy tales. The word is not fairy. The word is fairy. They are fairy tales. And fairy is the old English word for magic. And now you see why they are fairy tales. Because the one thing a fairy tale must have, not fairies, not even witches, but magic, and goodness knows, L. Frank Baum understood that when he created this wonderful world of Oz. It is, The Wizard of Oz, the most famous fairy tale of all. I'm sure that does not surprise you. What might surprise you is why even bother to say it's an American fairy tale? Does it make any difference where the origin of the country, of the person who first created it, you know, does it? It does indeed. In fact, if you read a fairy tale pretty carefully, you can usually find out what country originated it. For example, Jack and the Beanstalk. If you ever wondered, I wonder where Jack and the Beanstalk started. Well, don't forget, you know, the famous fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of a Englishman. You don't have to be a genius to figure that that fairy tale is English. Something like Pinocchio. Where would Pinocchio come from? Well, it turns out that the country that first invented the puppet was Italy. They called them poopy, they still do. And of course, with the origin of the puppet coming from Italy, the most famous puppet story is going to be from that country. A little more vague, but absolutely. If you wonder, what about um, The Little Mermaid or The Ugly Duckling or so many others by Hans Christian Andersen? If you didn't know where he was from, you would know from reading 60% of his fairy tales that always take place near water. So it's gonna be some country, some Scandinavian country that is surrounded by water. And indeed it is with that, with Denmark. The most fair, famous fairy tale ever written, this won't surprise you, the one that has been translated into more languages than any other, it is Cinderella. And I'm sure you're not surprised. Now, what country is the origin of Cinderella? You've really got to read this one carefully, but if you do your job well, you will figure out that Cinderella had to be invented from somebody in China. No, there's nothing particularly uh, Chinese about it, except the entire plot of Cinderella turns on how tiny a woman's foot is 
so that it will slip into the glass slipper. No country on earth would care about tiny women's feet like the Chinese do. And that's how we know, in fact, it is true, it comes from China. Well, that's enough about that. You're here to hear about L. Frank Baum, so let us get at him. His life is fascinating. It would be fascinating if it was a rags to riches story. It is not. It would be interesting if it was a, a riches to rags story, but it isn't. As you're, you'll hear, L. Frank's Baum life went from riches to rags, back to riches, and unfortunately ending in rags. It is a fascinating story. And let's start with his name, L. Frank Baum. You can be sure that when he was born, his parents didn't look at him and say, he looks like an L. Frank, let's give him that name. People are not named for an initial and then a name. Now there's plenty of authors who are known by their initials, T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence. There's a whole list of E.E. E. Cummings comes to mind. But it's rare to have somebody like an L. Frank. In other words, first name initial, then middle name. The only other famous one is F. Scott Fitzgerald. And that wasn't his name. His full name was Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald because he was related to Francis Scott Key. And he wanted to hide that because he wanted to be more famous than his relative who invented the Star Spangled Banner. So usually if you have a first initial and a middle name, you are hiding something. And that is the case with L. Frank Baum. He was named Lyman Frank Baum, but he always went by Frank. And when he wrote, it was L. Frank. Why did he want to get rid of the uh, Lyman? Because when he was born in the middle of the 19th century, if your first name, Lyman, happened to be a fairly common last name, it meant you were rich. Your parents, in naming you, wanted people to know that you came from very wealthy stock. And that's why when he started to write middle-class stories, and goodness knows the uh, a Wizard of Oz, a fairy tale, is a middle-class, basically, story, he wanted to hide the Lyman and call himself L. Frank. Well, I told you he was rich. He was born May 15th, 1856. He was born in your state. He comes from Syracuse, New York. Now, I'm sure there's many, many great authors from Syracuse, but it's not the kind of city like New York or Boston or Philadelphia that you think of that produces a lot of famous authors. But I'd say if Syracuse never produced anybody else but L. Frank, or let's just call him Frank Baum, that would be more than enough in the history of great literature. So he's from Syracuse, but he's really not from Syracuse. He's from the estate he was born on, which was called Rose Lawn. It was a gated estate. It went on for acres and acres. His father made his fortune in oil. And so L. Frank Baum was not brought up with other little kids or running around the city. He didn't leave the estate for quite a few years. He had a very, very sheltered childhood. Of course, he didn't go to school. He didn't even have somebody come in and tutor him. Instead, two young men from London, England were sent to tutor him. This is how wealthy they were. They found the best tutors they could find throughout Europe and they brought him in. Well, he was a second son. So the pressure was off him. As far as the oil business and everything else, that was going to go to the first son. And it's a good thing he was the second son because he sure wasn't cut out for business. He was a dreamer. He wandered the estate looking at the sky so much, daydreaming all the time. His father was very upset because, you know, the bombs didn't really come from daydreaming stock. So he sent him to a really strict military school. Frank hated it and he dropped out at 14 and he would never have any more formal education from that point on. But he was a researcher. He got into a hobby that absolutely possessed him from age 14 to 21. This passion of his was so strong that he really became an authority on this one topic. You could have thousands of guesses as to what really 
caught his interest and was a real passion with him, you'd never get it. He became one of the greatest authorities, very young in America, on Hamburg thoroughbred chickens. You know, you can't make this up. I could make it up, but you don't have to. This is a young man who fell in love with thoroughbred chickens. He knew so much about the topic, as if anybody else would care to know about it, that he wrote a book on it. And because, of course, his father had all that money, the book was privately published before he was 20 years old. Well, needless to say, this business family was very worried about Frank because all he wanted to talk about, think about, and research was chickens. So his uncle, his father's brother, who was quite wealthy too, decided he needed a different passion. So he took him to New York City over and over again. And sure enough, Frank would forget about the thoroughbred chickens and fall in love with Broadway and everything theatrical. He loved the stage. He loved the backstage life. He wanted to become an actor. And so his family was so thrilled that he was off chickens and on to something that really, you know, you could be proud of that they did something that most people who have kids who uh, are interested in it couldn't do. They bought Frank an opera house so that he could be the leader of the troupe. Now, even the bombs weren't rich enough to buy this opera house in uh, New York City. Nobody could afford that, really. So it was in upstate New York. I forget exactly where it was, but he owned this opera house. And he was an actor. He was a director. He was a producer. He was a big, big deal. What was in this tiny little upstate New York City, uh, uh, upstate New York place. And so it, all his family didn't think it would go very well. But they were shocked when they got a letter from him, not six weeks later, that says, my opera house has caught fire in this town. Sadly, it meant that it had burnt down. So that was the end of the opera house. And the sad thing was that Frank and all his young friends had written quite a good musical from what we hear when we research L. Frank Baum, a really good musical, and it was to open in his opera house that burnt down 10 days before the opening. Well, these young people had a show. They wanted to put it on. They couldn't put it on there. And so they were young and eager and strong. They decided they would go across the country. They would take it on the road and have performances throughout the country at places that would hire them so that they get the kind of experience, much better experience than they would have gotten if they could have actually performed it, you know, in New York. So they started in New York, they went to Pennsylvania, they went to Ohio, they went to Indiana, they went to Illinois. They crossed the Mississippi, they were in Missouri, they kept going, they were gonna go all the way to California, but he was not very good with money and his money ran out before they got to California because then they were gonna do a Southern route all the way back to New York. So they were kind of stuck. You may wonder, well, you know, what state did they run out of money? I never can remember, but I wrote it down. Oh, here it is. They ran out of money in, Kansas. It is the one and only time L. Frank Baum would be in Kansas, but it was burnt into his memory. And so years later, when he writes his immortal story, he made sure it would be placed in the place they last be performed before they had to turn around. Well, he's now 23 years old. Unfortunately, as a second son, he didn't have all that much money, particularly since his father and uncle's business was failing, but they wanted to get him married. And so his aunt held a Christmas party and invited all sorts of young girls that she thought would be good for Frank. And there was one in particular by the name of Maud Gage that the aunt thought would make a perfect wife for Frank. So at the party, his aunt has Maud uh, in her hand. She comes up to Frank and says, Frank, this is Maud Gage. You're gonna love her. And so Frank looked at this attractive woman and said, consider yourself loved. And Maud looked at him and she answered, she said, if that's a promise, Frank, I expect you to keep it for the rest of our lives. Now, this was a forward young girl. She was a feminist before there were feminists 
issues. She was very, very big on women's rights. And she wanted him to know from the start, she was not a young woman who would be trifled with. And by golly, they became engaged six weeks later. They were married three months later. And for the rest of their lives, they had a very successful marriage. Not everything will be a success for Frank, but this will be. Well, now what's he going to do? Well, it turns out that Maud had a sister who was married as well. So Frank now has a sister-in-law and a brother-in-law, and they decided what they wanted to do because it was 1884 and there was a terrible panic in the United States then and nobody was making any money. They decided they would strike out for the South Dakota territory and they, invented, they invited Maud and Frank to go with them. So Maud and Frank leave New York with, uh, with their relatives, they go there, they end up in what is today right about where Aberdeen, South Dakota was. Well, this was a shock for Frank, who grew up on, remember, Rose Lawn, this magnificent estate of, I don't know, 125 acres uh, in Syracuse. And now, as he writes his parents, we've been in the South Dakota territory for over three days, I have yet to see a tree. Now, maybe that wasn't completely honest, but you know, it was just the prairie, plains. There'd been a drought. There was nothing green, no trees, no grass, just dust and dirt. Well, he takes a look around at what will become Aberdeen, South Dakota, and Frank realizes amazingly, nobody in South Dakota had opened a store where you could find, where you could sell fine imported bone china from England. The market was unclaimed. So Frank in his naive way decided that's what Aberdeen needed. So he opened up a small department store that specialized in fine china. He called it Bombs Bazaar. And was it ever bizarre? It was a complete failure, of course, because the last thing people, when a panic, economic panic is going on, they're not thinking about fine bone china. But there was work there. They liked the neighbors. They'd schlepped all the way up to South Dakota so they weren't coming home any, uh, very soon. And they would have a family of four boys before they would leave South Dakota. Now, when these boys got to be about five, three, no, seven, five, four, and three in the afternoon at four o'clock every afternoon to entertain his four boys because Maud was insistent that they did 50% of the work in rearing these kids. What he'd always wanted to do was take his children under a beautiful tree and tell them fairy tales. Sadly, there were no trees in South Dakota, so that wasn't going to work. So they kind of sat on the porch where everything was dull and gray and dusty and dirty, and he would make up stories. And the kind of stories he made up the whole time they were in South Dakota, they were stories that were vivid and vibrant. Because there wasn't any color to this territory, he made sure there was going to be color in his stories. He invented lands where it would rain lemonade. The rivers that he invented were made of cream, which was perfect for him because the rapids, of course, of the river became whipped cream. He had a very vivid imagination that way. But the city that he invented where all of his stories took place because there was no tree and no grass, he invents this magical city of an incredibly vibrant color. If you ever used Prell shampoo, or you know anything about the Wizard of Oz, you know the name of the city. He invents in South Dakota, Emerald City, because it was such a vivid color. No, there's no wizard, there's no anything, there's no land of Oz, but this vibrant city will be the basis for eventually the Wizard of Oz. Well, they finally leave this godforsaken territory and they go to the nearest city where people could purchase if they wanted fine bone china. That is, of course, Chicago, Illinois. Even back then, it was a center for culture in the Midwest. So they move to Chicago and a room in his house is an office where he 
takes orders. It's not anymore a department store. He couldn't afford that. But he does take order from the richest Chicago people. And goodness knows he knew how to be around rich people since he had been one. And he starts a very good business. So it's pretty much a mail order business to get China, uh, fine bone China from England. But it does very well. They have a room in the house that's reserved for it. Well, every Wednesday evening after dinner, he allowed his four sons, who are now a bit older, to invite one friend each. And after dinner, they would go to Baum's office. They would sit on the floor, because it was the biggest room in the house, actually. And they'd just sit at his feet, and he would tell them these incredible stories. And everything was going well until Maud, his rather progressive wife, pointed out to Frank, you realize our four boys always invite a boyfriend to hear your good stories. It's not fair. She said, just last week, a family moved in three doors down. There's a little girl, the age right in the middle of our four sons. I want one of them to invite that girl to come over to hear a new story you've invented or we're canceling fairy tale hour. Well, Frank was, of course, 100% behind it. They finally got their son to go over and ask the little kid to come over. She comes over. So for the first time, there's the four sons, the three boyfriends, and finally a little girl. I forget what her name was, but I wrote it down. Oh, here it is. Her name was Dorothy. Had Maud not asked Frank to get a girl in here. And when he was making up a story, looking at these kids, had he only had boys, I'm pretty sure as an audience, there never would have been a Wizard of Oz. So he has his main character, the inspiration sitting right in front of him. And he tells this incredible story about Dorothy and the tornado and being hurled off to this magical land. Now he couldn't just have a story with the girl. He had to have friends like you need in a fairy tale. And at this point, this is the late, late 1800s, the most popular parlor game was animal, mineral, vegetables. When you had to guess what someone was thinking of was an animal, a mineral, or a vegetable. And so that made him think, well, I'll have the three friends of Dorothy be one of each. Well, the animal was easy. He invents the cowardly lion. And the mineral was very easy too, because everybody knew about a tin woodman. So he's got the animal and he's got the mineral, but he had to come up with a vegetable on the spot. Well, you're not gonna have a Mr. Broccoli or a Miss Peas, but back then nobody called a scarecrow a scarecrow. They were called a straw man. And straw is a vegetable, if you think about it. And so he needed some kind of vegetable. So that's how he got the three famous characters, the animal, the mineral, and the vegetable. And he makes up quite a bit of this. Emerald City, of course, is the central city as it always is with him. And quite a bit of what we have, the Wizard of Oz was invented maybe the day before, but when he adds Dorothy to it that day. So he ends the story and everybody's looking really excited except for Dorothy. And Frank says, any questions? And Dorothy says, I have a question. Where does this story take place? And Frank thinks, goodness, she wasn't listening. Dear, he said, it takes place in Emerald City. I know that, says Dorothy, but what's the name of the country? What's the name of the world? You didn't call it anything. And by golly, Frank didn't call it. It was the wizard, but it was, wasn't the wizard of any particular country. And Dorothy is a firm-minded little girl. He needs to come up with a name. Well, he wants a weird name for this world and can't think of any. He always tells the story at the front of the office, facing the window so he can see some outside. In the back of the office, there's windows, but there are two huge file cabinets with all his records in them, piled one on top of the other, so that when he walks to the back of the room, he can look up any order. Now, the bottom file cabinet held all the correspondence from A through N. And so he thinks, the Wizard of Ann, that didn't do anything for him. You know what's coming. He looked at the top file cabinet, which contained all the correspondence from O to Z. And he said, well, dear, he was the wizard of Oz. Just think if that top file cabinet had had P through Z, 
it would have been the Wizard of Puzz and it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. But that's how we get the name Oz, just because he had the file cabinets and this clever Dorothy asked him about it. Well, we need to go back now to fairy tales in general, because I want to show you how Frank Baum took a basic fairy tale story that so many of them, as you're about to hear, had, but he gave it a twist to make it unique and actually American, as you will hear later. The most common fairy tale setting, if you count up all the fairy tales, most are German, most are European, if you count them all, this will not surprise you. Most of them are about a girl in the woods. That's what fairy tales start with so many times. Now, why do fairy tales start with a girl in the woods? Well, most of them were written probably in the medieval period. And when you looked out your window, you know, that's what you saw, a girl in the woods. If you were writing it today, it'd be a teenager in the mall and it wouldn't be any good at all. But back then it was a girl in the woods. If you gave her a brother, you ended up with Hansel and Gretel. If you gave her to midgets, you'd end up with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. If you gave her to grizzlies, of course, you'd have Goldilocks and the Three Bears. If you sent her to grandma, it's Little Red Riding Hood. But I don't care what the plot is, the setting is a girl in a woods. Now notice, it's never a girl in a forest. She's always in the woods. You wouldn't think there'd be a big deal in this, but there is. The reason it's always a girl in the woods is because a forest in the Middle Ages was a land tract owned by a king for hunting. It was huge. It was formal. It was civilized. It went on forever. You can't have a little girl getting lost in a forest because you walk in a forest you're gone for good, you're never coming out. That's why it's always a girl in the woods. Woods are a dense growth of trees. It's actually, woods are bigger than a grove, but smaller than a forest. And the reason so many fairy tales are with woods is because in a forest, you can't encounter something strange because the king owns it and everything interesting has been wiped out. But you can encounter unknown weird things in a woods. You can be lost in a woods, but you can always find your way out because they're not uh, because it's not so big. I only mention this because we don't today care about the difference between a forest and a woods, except in one way. Let's say, God forbid, you have a friend who had a serious, serious heart attack, and she's in the hospital, and she's a little bit better, so you go to visit her. And as you're walking to her room, you see the doctor coming out from her room, and you recognize this is her doctor. So before you go in, she want, you want to know her condition. So you go up to the doctor and say, I'm so-and-so, and so-and-so is my friend. I just want to know, how is she doing? Now, if the doctor says to you, well, She's not out of the forest yet. You might as well plan the funeral. This woman's not going to make it. Notice we always say she's not out of the woods because that means it's bad, but you can get out of it. <clears throat> now, I mention all this because when he started this story with Dorothy and she's going someplace, it's a little girl and you're going to think it's a woods. Well, if there's anything more opposite in a plot that has a little girl in a fairy tale than the Wizard of Oz is to that, I can't think of it. Rather than being just a woods, it is this incredible, technological, unbelievable, phantasmagoric land of Oz. He took the girl, but he made everything else rather different. Well, Maud heard the story and the kids loved it, as did Dorothy once, you know, he had a, the Wizard of Oz. She said, you know, this could make money. You need to write it up. So he writes it up and he had a friend in Chicago in walking distance who owned a publishing house. So he took it to him. The publisher read it and said, we're going to publish it. And so in a year, it's hard to forget, 1900 the Wizard of Oz is published. Well, back then, you know, you didn't have charts in the internet. You didn't know how things went for quite some time, but he got a telegram from the publisher saying, we have your first royalty check, come and get it. 
what was close enough that they could just walk about 20 minutes and pick up the royalty check. And before they go, Maud says to him, you know, Frank, if it would be for $50, that would give our sons a good college start, a fund. Just $50, maybe 75. Do you think it could be like that? I don't know, says Frank. And he left her ironing shirts. He goes, he picks up the check, he comes back, and Maud looks at him and says, is it $50? Frank says, no, Maud. This check is for $3,432, $3,400. And if you knew what $3,400 could buy in 1900, there was never such a spectacularly selling child story so quickly as the Wizard of Oz. The royalties were unbelievable. Well, they knew they had probably the best story uh, of that year or for the whole decade. So the publishers went all out writing publicity blurbs so everybody would buy The Wizard of Oz. Well, Baum was not famous as a children's writer, but there was a children's writer living in 1900 who was the most famous. His name, of course, our greatest author in American literature, Mark Twain. Yes, he wrote all sorts of more uh, sophisticated things, but The Prince and the Pauper, uh, <laughs> Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, they were kids' stories with an awful lot in them. And so they thought, if we could get Mark Twain just to give us a sentence saying how much he likes this book. So they send it off to Twain, and to be honest, Twain was not happy with L. Frank Baum. He thought the story was fine, but it annoyed the heck out of him that there he'd been for 20 years on top of the kids' market, and here is this newcomer who's making $3,400 in royalties, but Twain had to appear, appear big. He couldn't say, I'm not writing a blurb. So he said, I will write a one-sentence blurb for him. So they get the blurb and I will read you what Mark Twain wrote. He wasn't going to, of course, put him down, but when you hear the blurb, you will understand, yes, this is something Mark Twain must have written. Twain wrote, I think nobody would deny that The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum is the greatest children's work of fiction in the entire 20th century. He wrote that on January 9th. So what he was saying is for the first nine days of this new year, this is the best work. It was a lovely put down without making Twain sound really, really petty. Anyway, <clears throat> it took off in ways Baum could not have thought because this is 1900, vaudeville was be, the thing. When we think of vaudeville, we think of comics, we think of maybe strippers even, but the thing about vaudeville was they always appeared on that huge stage. And by 1902, the stage effects, the things you could do on stage were incredible. The technology was there so that you could make a regatta of ships appear on stage. They could actually have a tank. I mean, they really made it look realistic. Well, in 1902, they had just invented a snow blowing machine. Of course, it wasn't snow, it was something white, but you could make a complete blizzard appear on stage. And in vaudeville back then, after all the acts, the animal acts, the comedians and everything else, the jugglers, the final scene, the curtains would close and when they opened, it would be a scene technologically incredible on that stage that was from a famous work that everybody was talking about. Well, it's everybody's talking about The Wizard of Oz and they had the snow blowing now. So if you remember when Dorothy and the three friends are lying there in the forest actually down there and that blizzard, that snow blizzard comes out of nowhere and buries them, well, it was too good for vaudeville stages to resist. So not only was he selling, but when the last act opened throughout the country, because Vaudeville wanted to advertise they could make snow, he was making more publicity, doing absolutely nothing. Everything was going sensationally. And then I told you his story was uh, riches to rags to riches. Well, unfortunately for L. Frank Baum, he got the idea in 1905 that the technology was right for something nobody had ever tried. And what it was is very simple. 
what was coming out were slide projectors back then. And you could have five or six slide projectors with different slides projecting onto a large back of a stage. And he decided to make little slides of every scene of The Wizard of Oz and flash them on the back of the stage, telling the story in a way nobody had told it before. He invested all of his money that he was making from this all of it into this technology. He opened this slide sh uh, show, Bonanza he called it, and it was a complete dud. The technology was wonderful, but by slicing the story up on 10 different machines, projecting it in 15 different places, the Wizard of Oz lacked in this uh, representation, the very thing that the Tin Woodman was looking for. It had no heart at all. It was just technology. We understand that today, of course, better than they did. And it was a bust. And so he was a bust as well. He actually didn't go bankrupt, but almost did. They had to leave and Chicago and go out to the far west, San Diego, in fact. What he sold himself as was a man in a white suit who could go to a very, very expensive hotel, a resort hotel, and all the wealthy kids of the wealthy parents who wanted to get rid of their kids for an afternoon, L. Frank Baum would tell them stories. So he went from one nice resort to another telling these beautiful stories, but it wasn't enough to make him enough money and they were in big trouble. And so finally, the one way he could get a lot of money in a short time was if, and this man made the deal, they told Frank, we'll get you a lot of money. All you have to do is sell all future rights to the Wizard of Oz, your story. Once you release that so anybody can publish it, then we'll give you the money. Well, we all would have screamed at him from the 21st century, don't do it. It was the most precious thing he would ever have. But he had a family, he had four boys and they were growing, but they weren't grown. And so he sold away all the rights. Well, they couldn't afford to live near San Diego. So they go in 19, let me make sure I get the year right. They go in 1912 to a real cheap suburb outside of Los Angeles that was just becoming a little podunk. And so you could get cheap land. The town was named for the wood of a shrub that had glossy leaves and red berries. Well, you know that the plant was, of course, the holly plant, but it was named for its wood. And so they called the town Hollywood. L. Frank Baum is one of the first people to live in Hollywood. It's two years before it would come become a movie capital. So they moved to Hollywood and um, he has to do something. And then, his lawyer tells him, well, you know, you've given all the, all the rights away to your story, The Wizard of Oz. But, you know, I wonder if Dorothy and her friends had adventures after The Wizard of Oz, Oz ends. In other words, sequels haven't been given away. So they do the legal research and find out that he can never make any money on The Wizard of Oz. He can write sequels of The Wizard of Oz with the same characters sell them, and sure enough, he can get money. So he starts writing sequels to The Wizard of Oz. I'm sure some of you have read some of them. They're not very good. Again, they lack heart. He was writing it for money. Back in Chicago, when he invented it, he was writing it for Dorothy, this little girl, and Maud, who always championed girls' rights. Now he's just writing for money. And although he was making money, he had integrity. Finally, at the end, and let me make sure I'm just looking at the notes to find out which one uh, it happened. It, um, he wrote six of them, and they were all bad. And he decided at the end of the sixth, the last sentence would say, a shield of invisibility has fallen over the land of Oz and I am no longer able to see what our friends are doing. And that was that. He kept his integrity and the sixth would be the last. And then nothing happened and nobody wanted anything else he'd written. And if you ever get the sequels, look at the seventh sequel. You know how the seventh sequel opens? The barrier of invisibility has lifted. 
from the world of Oz and we can continue the adventure. So sure enough, he goes on and on making new adventures, none of them very good. It affected his health. He had angina to begin with. And in 1919, he will die at, to me, the rather young age of 63. Now he was not gone and forgotten. He wasn't making any money, but everybody loved the Wizard of Oz and they knew he had written it, though he wasn't making any money on it. And listen to this, the New York Times, a day after Baum died, put his obituary in the corner of the front page. And let me read you the opening lines of what the New York Times said about Al, Al Frank Baum on his death. Quote, L. Frank Baum is dead and all the children in the United States, if they knew it, would be in deep mourning. Isn't that a lovely thing to say about an author? Well, that's it with The Wizard of Oz until 1939, as we know, when the movie comes out of The Wizard of Oz. Well, you know what a success the movie must have been. How much money did The Wizard of Oz make in 1935? It's a real easy number to remember. Zero. It actually lost money when it first came out. I mean, the reasons, it's pretty hard, impossible to believe it would, except when you hear the other movies that came out in 1939. Gone with the Wind, Goodbye Mr. Chips, Dark Victory, Wuthering Heights, it goes on and on. All of these incredible movies come out. And so it didn't make money, but we all know it would make money a few years later, because what would happen in 1956, when colored televisions were just becoming popular, the big wigs at Magnavox that wanted to sell their colored TVs came up with a wonderful idea. Why don't we put the best color movie from the past as a television show? So the people who own it can see it and they will invite most of their friends who don't have color TVs to watch it and see what color can do. Well, it was only one movie that would do. It was Gone with the Wind the same year <clears throat> as The Wizard of Oz came out. And it probably would have been Gone with the Wind, but one of the underlings, one of the young people who worked for Magnavox said, no, that's not what we should do. If you wanna sell color television, what you need to do is to put on that evening a show, a movie that begins in black and white, but moves to color. And there was only one. If you know The Wizard of Oz well, the movie, you know it begins in Kansas, like South Dakota, gray and black and dreary. But the minute Judy Garland ends up in Oz, it's technicolor. And that was a brilliant stroke. So they put on the Wizard of Oz, because people could see black and white versus color. Everybody ran out to buy colored television sets. And as you probably know, it was so successful that first year that every spring you can turn on around Easter time, there will be a showing of The Wizard of Oz. And for years and years, it turns out that The Wizard of Oz, um, <clears throat> there was a narrator, there was a uh, Master of Ceremonies, it was always a character who had been in the movie, like Ray Bolger. Judy Garland never did it, but all the other ones did. The woman who played the Wicked Witch of the West, Margaret, I can't remember her name, but I know some of you remember, she did it. Well, of course, now it's 2022. I mean, they have scraped the bottom of the barrel. I think there's only one person, and that kid would have had to have been a baby, not just a, one of the uh, munchkins. And so we're about out of masters of ceremonies who actually could have been in that movie. The last thing I wanted to tell you about Wizard of Oz, I began by saying it was the greatest American fairy tale. What makes us know, whether we know it or not from having research, that Wizard of Oz could only have come from America? First of all, the action is all taking place because of a tornado that comes in early and whisks her off. There are cyclones all over the world. There are hurricanes, typhoons, but the tornado is distinctly American. You just don't hear about those wind episodes in the rest of the world being called tornadoes. Second of all, it is named for the Wizard of Oz. He is not a wizard. 
he's not from Oz. We all know that the Wizard of Oz, once Dorothy, no, once Toto exposes the curtain, pulls the curtain back, you know what the Wizard of Oz is. He is a snake oil salesman. There's salesmen all over the world, but it is our sad fate as Americans. We invented the snake oil salesman. He seems to have gone into politics and he seems to be everywhere in politics, even today. And the third thing that makes it an American story is Dorothy. Baum tells us when he invented her looking at that little girl that night, he wanted to make her brave, kind, and shrewd. And she is brave, the Witch of the West, kind and shrewd. And Baum believed that those three take, uh, traits, bravery, being shrewd, and being kind, are particularly American. We're Americans, so we're biased in the same way. But the most amazing thing he did, just standing on his feet that night in his office, telling the story to his kids and Dorothy, he cleverly decided when he invented his three animal, mineral, and vegetable characters, what would they want from the Wizard of Oz? Well, the scarecrow wanted a brain. He wanted to be shrewd. And the cowardly lion wanted, of course, courage. She, he wanted to be brave. And the tin woodman wanted a heart. He wanted to be kind. One wants kindness, one wants shrewdness, one wants bravery. They all join hands on the yellow brick road as they move towards the wizard to get them. But the joke that I hope, I didn't get it when I read it early on. The joke is of course, that they were holding hands with Dorothy who had all three. They didn't have to go to the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, just living the personality she had, showed them exactly what ultimate shrewdness and bravery and kindness were. And of course, the main thing that makes it American, it is a quest story. Like most fairy tales, you start off one place, you go someplace else. With European fairy tales, the quest is always you start out a peasant, but you end up a prince. You find out there was someone way back in your family or whatever. You know, you start in a crummy little place, you know, where you grew up and then you ended up. In... But Wizard of Oz is that amazing fairy tale that starts in a very drab place, Dorothy, her aunt's home. She goes to the absolute heights in, in Oz. And all she wants is to go back to home. You don't find fairy tales except the Wizard of Oz that starts low, goes high, and then goes right back. There's no place like home. European fairy tales would never have that as their motto, and that's too bad for them. Because if you live in America, you can understand that indeed, just your humble beginnings should be enough.